Okay, I think now is a good a time as uh, as any to to start today's uh, webinar. So once again, thank you very much for um, attending. And the topic we're going to be looking at today are uh, insights from an internationally co-developed MOOC on digital citizenship. I will be moderating uh, this session and um, I have three uh, colleagues and friends with me. Firstly, Fabio Nascimbeni, who's a senior expert from Unimed in Italy. Um, Cristina Stefanelli, who's a project manager from also from Unimed. And finally, Beatriz Sidano, who's a research associate at UNED, my uh, institution um, as well. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do now is share my screen with you, which I'll do like that, and then I can swap over to our presentation. So you should be able to, to see our presentation. Um, okay, insights from an internationally co-developed uh, MOOC on digital citizenship. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, an awful lot um, possibly too much has been said and written on MOOCs and uh, what they actually mean for online education, um, access to open educational resources, and but, and um, a whole range of uh, related uh, subjects. The reason that today we decided to um, focus on this particular topic was actually motivated um, from uh, uh, an Erasmus Plus project that we're actually running at the moment. Um, the Nexus project, which is running from 2019 to 2022. And um, in this project, we're actually trying to um, in enable uh, typically migrants um, and younger people to improve their, their digital citizenship, become more active. And that's typically more online these days than in a face-to-face -face, uh, context. And we're trying to do this by reaching them firstly with um, with a MOOC as part of their, of their training, although if the, the pandemic actually allows us, we hope to have some face-to-face -face training later on. Um, we're also reviewing the role of uh, service learning in the, uh, in the community and how to really engage with uh, with this um, social collective, and then looking at the social, um, the digital tools that can be used for um, for this particular activity. So, if we looked at the agenda again, I'm doing uh, the first point at the moment. I'm introducing the session for you, trying to, to motivate uh, um, the, the 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 webinar because it's essentially what happened is that as we were working together as an international team on the MOOC for this um, particular project, it's when it uh, it became ever Evident that uh, we really had some some things to say about this whole de developmental uh, process, and then uh, my colleague Fabio will actually take more of a critical view of how MOOCs are typically developed and uh, contrast between the different aspects there. Bayer will take over and actually focus on how uh, we did it in this particular project. Um, Christina will present the, the results of our MOOC so far, although it's in the final stage of being developed and we're, we'll be releasing it in, um, in April. So that's something for you to look forward to. And then I'll, I'll contextualize this process because um, I used to be in charge of the Open UNED MOOC platform and project. So um, when we kicked this off in 2012, I've got a, a different perspective than, than how we've done it and uh, maybe can make some interesting comparatives there. And then at the end, we'll have a, a collaborative activity. We set up a, a Padlet for you to share um, your insights and opinions on this particular topic with us. So just to let you know that um, when I'm moving these slides, I won't actually be able to see the chat. So I won't actually be able to answer any, any comments you make in the chat. And I would please like to ask you to put any questions you have in the Q&A tool and not in the chat, because as a, since the chat is just a sequential list of text, then it'll get to the stage where it's just not possible to see the earlier um, questions, and it would be a shame to, um, to miss any. Okay, so without any more ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and great to be here in this uh, webinar, actually tackling a, a very much discussed issue that is MOOCs, uh, as you were saying, Tim, probably even too much discussed in the, in the last years, but I think it's uh, during the Open Education Week is something we should at least uh, look at to see if new things are emerging, and actually we, we hope to present you with something new. So uh, let's start from uh, um, just a, a brief summary of the typical critical points of MOOCs. As you all know, MOOCs have been uh, depicted as the great revolution, the avalanche, the thing that would change education as we know it. This was back in 2012-13, and then 
uh, they were criticized for a number of reasons. And then, of course, in the last uh, year, they had a, another boost uh, due to the pandemic and the social distancing. But actually here we, 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 we collected a few of the critical points of MOOCs, uh, looking at literature and at the different uh, debates around this. So a typical critique to MOOCs is the very high rate of dropouts. Uh, at the beginning, we we're speaking about only 6% of people who are starting a MOOC uh, they are finishing this MOOC. But still, of course, these are still very big numbers uh, because, as we know, uh, a number of MOOCs are reaching thousands and thousands of people. And also, connected to the second point, uh, uh, the, the, the low percentage of actors Active participants. Many people register in a MOOC, uh, maybe look at something, participate a bit, don't finish uh, the MOOC. Uh, but actually, this is what happens on the web. And since we are, for most of this, in the in the area of informal learning and of uh, curiosity boosted learning as well, uh, we think this is also something quite natural for this sort of uh, courses. Again, another uh, fierce critic is the fact that MOOCs are not typically built on OER, on openly licensed resources, but still, they are still usable for free. So it is better than nothing. And there is now, these very days, a big debate on a, on a very known open education mailing list about uh, uh, the importance uh, and the, the, the reason why we are working on open educational resources. I mean, the reason for this is to reach as many people as possible. MOOCs actually are doing the job somehow, if, if you look at the uh, real figure. And then, of course, MOOCs who are often presented as the, the, the thing that can democratize education, can reach everybody on the planet with the best courses. But actually, if you look at the data, it seems that the typical, not the only one, but the typical participant in MOOCs uh, is uh, well-educated, is a person who knows what to learn, how to learn, and actually is a Caucasian and with a good income and typically from the North, of course, uh, we have different ecosystems of MOOCs in China, in Brazil, in India, this massive number. So this is a bit a generalization, but it is true that MOOCs have been criticized a lot for this, uh, let's say, missed promise, at least. And then as well, uh, most of MOOCs are uh, designed and developed in English by Western institutions, by Western professors, typically US, uh, with a Silicon Valley communication style. And so many people talk about uh, the colonialist aspect of MOOC, which is uh, in some cases definitely an aspect, but in not in all of them. You have a lot of uh, new MOOC platforms, again, from the south of the world, which are actually doing very well. So. This is also a critic, which is, let's say, debatable. And then another interesting critic is that MOOCs are not pedagogically innovative. It is like if, uh, in, especially when we talk about the so-called X MOOCs, so the MOOCs, uh, which typical Coursera MOOCs or Future Learn MOOCs, uh, where you don't really have a lot of collaboration, but you tend to replicate the transmissive logic and the transmissive method of teaching. Let's say it seems uh, uh, that uh, MOOC designers uh, are um, putting a lot of emphasis on numbers, a lot of emphasis on content, a lot of emphasis on also packaging the content. But if you look at how innovative are these courses with, with respect to other courses uh, online there, which are not called MOOCs, uh, uh, actually there, you can see that the level of innovative is, is not always present. So you have, of course, a, num a number of experiments uh, still going on with the more connectivist approach and with the more, I would say, different kind of um, pedagogical approach. But it's hard to respond to this critic, actually, because most of the MOOCs, if now you would uh, just search uh, randomly three MOOCs on the major platforms, you don't find a lot of pedagogical innovation. And uh, in, in the next slide, we see actually uh, connected to this point, uh, the, the, the key actually we, we believe is how you design a MOOC. Of course, uh, quality of content is one thing. The knowledge of the instructors is another important thing. The pedagogical approach is another very important thing. But actually when you start designing a MOOC, when typically a, either from the, from the top in a university comes uh, an invitation to a professor to design a MOOC, or when a professor decides, or a team of professors decide to, to transform a course into a MOOC or to design, to create a MOOC from scratch, they can do it in different ways. Now, on the, on the left side, you can see a, a picture I, I took from a, from a paper on MOOC designs. I won't mention the paper because I find this to be a bit too, 
I would say, engineering style. I mean, um, it's it's really a, a process with different steps. Uh, and then in, in this paper, you also have key performance indicators, like if creating a MOOC was like creating a new product for the market, which somehow it is, but it's not only that. Then in the middle, you see uh, a more collaborative way, which is uh, different heads uh, uh, thinking about different things and hopefully also about the same thing. So collaborating around the design of a MOOC. And then the third, uh, the third kind of design is the typical uh, transformational design. So you take a course, even a face-to-face course, and you say, okay, I want to make a MOOC out of this. I want to reach uh, thousands of students. So what I will do, I will translate it in English. And there already you have you must be able to translate it properly. I, and then uh, I, I really want to put it in a platform to, to structure it differently and so on. So just to say that MOOCs can be designed in many ways. And the way you design, the way you approach actual instructional design in a MOOC is, uh, is very important for what the, MOOCs, uh, the MOOC then becomes and for the final uh, learning experience of, uh, of the users. In the next slide, you see, um, let's say, a, a generalization, a caricaturization of what we call um, one-man MOOCs. So, you know, the famous one-man band uh, that play on the street. Actually, there you have a person that does everything, that does everything very well. It's typically impressive how these people can do everything. And here, the one-way MOOCs are, are really MOOCs that are uh, built and developed around a single person, typically around an educator. So there, or a team of educators from the same institution, but let's say one educator, let's generalize even more. So there you have one perspective. So it's pretty pretty clear. So the, you, you can only, see, only hear the perspective of the, the person who is actually providing the content. You have one teaching style. So typically from the beginning to the end of the MOOC, you have the same style. So you have the same tone, the same kind of activities uh, and, uh, and the same kind of assessment, for example. Typically, these are a transformation of frontal teaching. So normally it's, uh, it's uh, not always the case uh, that, I mean, the, the thought put into it, this transformational process is often not enough. So typically, if you look at especially at, uh, at uh, let's say the classic again Coursera or similar MOOCs, you have a person or a few more persons talking, people listening, and then uh, if if you're lucky, you can respond in a forum. Many times nobody comes back to that forum. You have a, an assessment, and that what happens in many university classrooms is not bad per se. The content is good. Again, I don't want to criticize this uh, per se, but just in terms of. Uh, uh, international collaboration and innovation potential. The idea is that with MOOCs, uh, you could do more, <clears throat> especially in a moment where you have such a big participation on the digital world by so many people. And of course, they depend on the leading professor, not only for the style and the content, but also for the quality of the overall experience, for the updating of the MOOC. So it's uh, typically the MOOC manager <clears throat> in a university, if the MOOC if they want to update the MOOC, they have to go back to this professor. And if this professor is very busy <coughs> or has moved to another university, then the MOOC is a bit orphan. So it's uh, it's difficult then for somebody else to come in and teach and update that MOOC. And you have, uh, if the MOOC is based on some cases or some practices, think of uh, business studies, but also as in our case of uh, digital activism and digital participation, the cases normally come from the ecosystem of this professor, from the country of this professor. So these are, the, the idea here is to go international, to go global, but typically with a <clears throat> very local perspective, which again, is not bad per se, but when this perspective is, as typically happens from the UK or from the, from the US or from the North, of course, the one of the first critics that we saw at the very beginning is, uh, is, is appearing even more. Then in the next slide, uh, I just want to say that this is not always the case. Uh, here it's an example of uh, my friend, Professor Juan Quemada from University Politecnica de Madrid, who uh, designed a fantastic one-man MOOC, actually. Uh, this is a professor of software engineering, very successful, uh, and uh, he has been teaching generations of students on how to, how to develop software in Spain. And at a certain point, uh, Miriada X, the Spanish uh, MOOCs platform, asked him to transform his teaching into a MOOC. And he said, yes, 
he took the challenge and uh, in the video down there you can see himself telling the story it's really interesting to see how he started by saying yeah that won't be very difficult I will just record myself and that's it on the other hand when he was doing this he started to understand that doing this right it's a totally different story so you need to rethink totally your your key concepts you need to rethink the thresholds of your students you need to rethink the technology of course and so it took him, I don't remember if one summer or even more of full time to really rethink his whole very successful course already. He did it well because actually now his MOOC on, on software engineering, software development is, I think, the most used MOOC in Miriada X in Spain and Latin America. So it's a huge success. And it's also one of the most visited and used MOOCs globally. So it's, uh, and there is not uh, the content itself. You have plenty of MOOCs on uh, software development, but this is really, uh, I suggest if you want to have a look at this MOOC, is really nicely thought, uh, nugget by nugget, concept by concept, every concept builds on the other. So you can really see how this, uh, this person, how this educator has gone through a self-reflection and a cha self-change management process in terms of teaching. In the next slide, you see actually what we did. And uh, so the, differently from the one-man band, we, we tried to orchestrate the MOOC. So there you see an orchestra. We were not as organized at that orchestra. So we were much more, I would say, in a, in a brainstorming mood for many, for many sessions. But orchestrated MOOCs are typically MOOCs that come where you have different people from different backgrounds, from different countries often, and from, from also from different language and different ways of looking at things, working together to develop a course. Now, in this case, you have many perspectives, which is good on one side. You can perceive it. You can provide students with more than one perspective, but it's also more difficult because you need to find often one idea for a number of subjects. And then, of course, you have a mixed teaching style, which is on one side a bit more chaotic. You don't get always the same thing, but on the other side is much more varied and much more interesting for the student. They are normally co-designed, internationally co-designed, and this means that you leave a lot of space for serendipity, for spontaneous ideas that maybe come in and then disappear and then come in again. And it's a, it's a very nice, uh, normally, again, labor intensive, but nice process of co-design. Co and of course, when a MOOC depends on a team, the quality, the updating, and the kind of cases of practical uh, information in the MOOC are also different. So the quality is, uh, is guaranteed not by one person, but by different people. Of course, each one of them with a different understanding of quality, but still different people looking at the same thing. Updating becomes much easier because you have, of course, more than one uh, leverages for when you want to update this MOOC. And of course, cases come from different contexts, uh, which is uh, normally more, uh, more interesting. So I just wanted to present you these two, uh, I would say, stereotypical ideas. Uh, a few MOOCs are totally orchestrated because also in our cases, we had a leader in the MOOC and we had, of course, a, quite a linear process we needed to have. And of course, also, one-man MOOCs are not only one man. There is a team beyond, beyond, beyond this professor and there are technical people working on it and so on. But these are the two, let's say, uh, limits of uh, how you can uh, design a, a MOOCs in terms of uh, a single person or collaborative effort. And I just wanted to present you these two uh, archetypes in order to then facilitate the discussion later on in the, in, in the, in the, the webinar. I tried not to be uh, to assign any value to my sentences because I wouldn't like to push too much for one or the other because of course there are also issues of efficiency, cost, time, which come into the picture. But uh, these are the main two that we started our reasoning from. I don't know if I have another slide, Tim. Yes, oh, yes. link one. Yeah, exactly. So here, I just want to show you for a moment uh, the, the Padlet that we intend to use later on. So basically, the exercise that we would like to do with you is to reflect together, uh, going beyond the, the easy answer that, of course, orchestrated is good and one-man MOOC is bad. This is never the case. You have some wonderful uh, one-man MOOCs, as I was telling you before. Of course, you have many issues coming into the picture, but uh, I would like you to propose this to us to then 
also to help us going on in this reflection and maybe to uh, transform also this initial reflection into a research paper. Why not? We could look also at other MOOCs, other orchestrated MOOCs to see how it, uh, how it is going. I think this was all as an intro from my side. Uh, I don't know. Thank you very much. For yeah, you. thanks. A wonder, wonderful uh, contextualization of the, the issue at hand. Just before handing over to, to Bea, you can see there's a there's a, a short leap at the bottom of the slide here. So I'm going to keep talking for a couple of minutes. You can type that in if you want to. And we'd very much like to, later on when we move on to the, uh, the interactive debate on the Padlet page, you'll have access to... Uh, um, to participate on there. Um, I think one thing that's worth adding is um, it's interesting that I think uh, Fabio's comments are applicable to all courses, not necessarily just MOOCs. I mean, they, the standard joke in the MOOC community is that MOOC itself is the only acronym that you don't actually have to obey any of the letters that make up the acronym itself. I mean, it can be massive or not. It can be open or not, etc. And um, I think this is actually a, an interesting point because when I talk to people about MOOCs and um, quite often somebody will come up and say, oh, you know, I'd really like to uh, to do a MOOC, but the thing is I don't have access to any uh, an institutional platform for my course. And, um, you know, it seems to be quite expensive to, to contact one of these giants to uh, to do the course on there. And, I, and um, I think something that needs to be taken into account is you don't really need these days to have a platform. A platform is more about branding and about certification than actually about course dynamics structure and content so that's the good news i mean if you're watching this webinar and you've always really wanted to uh get into doing MOOCs well you can there are different tools and, and ways of actually doing that and that's why i think that uh fabulous comments are still applicable to a very wide range of um of courses so thank you very much for that fabio i hope you you've all had time to uh to catch the uh padlet address see you there later i'm going to hand over to, to Beatrice now Thank you, Tim. I also uh, add the link to the of the Padlet to the chat. Okay, so we will come back to this later, right, Fabio? To the Padlet yeah. exercise, and we will explain. I'm gonna try uh, now to summarize uh, how we did our MOOC, uh, the process of collaborative MOOC. Um, so in this figure. You can see the steps that our team followed to create the MOOC. First, an, an it analysis of potential students and research of existing offer. Second, you can see the step of instructional curriculum design of the course. Then the elaboration of materials based on the collaborative work. And final, the test of piloting of the courses in the platform uh, before the, the launching. So actually, we are in this phase of final revision, OK? So um, I will explain a bit um, every step with some um, interesting facts um, that um, we, we took in, in, in account in the, in the process of designing. Uh, Tim, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, um, here, I mean, um, I think you are going to see the, the infographics maybe a, a bit small, but I, I, I'm going to just to to summarize some mm, interesting results. So uh, as I said, uh, the first step uh, of the process was conducted a neat analysis in order to know on one hand what was already done. So we look for other MOOCs or on open educational resources on the topic of civic education. Uh, and we analyze them to identify gaps and to create a different MOOC from the existing offer. Focused, as we uh, explain later, my colleague Christina will explain, focus more on the digital aspect and the participatory um, tools. And on the other hand, we launched a questionnaire among students from diverse backgrounds from the partners' uh, universities in Spain, Italy, Sweden, and uh, we got more than 2,050 responses, and we, we summarize the results in these infographics. But I, I just will comment a few um, things that were interesting for our, uh, our curriculum design. For example, um, on the uh, top left, um, in terms of participation, around 60% of students of respondents thought that they don't have the means to make their voice heard uh, 
in the internet, uh, digitally speaking. And that's for on the other side, we uh, you can see that there is a need for a change. Uh, uh, 97% uh, said that they want uh, their opinions to be heard. Um, and sec um, like 60% uh, would like to improve their level of social engagement. Also, what's interesting in the middle uh, town, the topics of interest, what are the interests of students, um, potential students for, for the MOOC? And they, they pointed out topics as uh, social justice, migration, feminism, that were useful to choose uh, our case studies. And uh, to finalize in summary, you can see at, at the um, at the right, uh, on the right of the uh, of the infographics, um, most of them they said they, they they are ready. They feel ready to invest time, um, also effort to receive more training in digital civic engagement, and that the best way, because they were as university students, will be as an extracurricular activity like a MOOC. So, uh, and they were very um, they. As, uh, for the methodology, they would like something practical, learning by doing. Um, what uh, was the the um, the main um, benefits they could see? They they said with this they could um, have more knowledge of what are the tools existing for participate in the digital uh, civic engagement. They also said they wanted to participate to know more uh, initiatives and also to reach and connect people, connect with people. That is something um, uh, interesting in a MOOC and also to exchange ideas. The idea of collaboration was already there uh, from their side. So can you pass the next slide? So after the neat analysis, uh, we we had the step of instructional curriculum design um, that this step was already performed in a collaborative collabor sorry collaborative way by all partners in the team. First, the responsible of uh, of this activity proposed yes um, uh, some instructional and curriculum design. Then the rest gave feedback. There was a collaborative revision implement changes, changes and revision again. So everything is being collaborative and, and iterative. So uh, I um, included this, um, we included this um, a image figure where you can see uh, one of the models that uh, instruction that we follow for our instructional design. Uh, among others, this one is um, proposed by, by Connell in 2014, and it's called the seven C's uh, of learning design. Everything is with a C. That is, um, and, and the, which follows like seven principles, you can call them steps, but they are not uh, just linear. So I will summarize um, to explain how we did the, the, the design. First, the conceptualized um, thing is, um, to conceptualize the pedagogical vision of the course, which are the topics, learning objectives, which will be the target audience based on the needs analysis, uh, and also the, the um, pedagogical approach. Um, so at the end of this phase, we had the structure and the flow of the course. Then uh, the second, uh, after many collaborative uh, revisions. Then the second, the create, um, is the creation of the educational, uh, educational resources, like learning materials, activities, new materials, selecting open educational resources. Um, then the third, communicate, um, is uh, refers to the selection and, uh, and configuration of the tools to facilitate communication that it was already uh, very important in the need analysis, no? such as the forums of, of the course and the activities. Four uh, is collaborate. That is, um, it reflects uh, to the uh, 
establishment of mechanisms to encourage collaboration and group work. So we decided to include, as uh, I will present in a bit, collaborative activities also um, within the, the MOOC. Then uh, we have the consider that uh, refers to provide also ways to reflect and demonstrate what has been learned through assessment and also final re reflection and put in practice that we, we put at the, at the end of our course as we will so. And also the important that as uh, Fabio uh, point out of having also a, a team of tutors that in MOOCs are called facilitators, yes, that um, they were uh, giving feedback um, to, to the students, meaning, meaningful feedback. Uh, then we have the combine. This is like an iterative step during all the design where all materials and activities are put together and contextualized in the overall course structure. This was done at the beginning with the first proposal, then another um, time after um, they will um, reflect on the uh, conceptual framework and flow, and then uh, also after all the creation of materials. And finally, consolidate. The last C um, corresponds to the implementation and piloting. So make the final adjustments. And finally, that we, we will do shortly, uh, launch the first edition, after which we will also evaluate the design in the real context, uh, and, and we will make improvements for future editions. And the last uh, side from my side, Tim, please, the collaborative work. I mean, in this uh, slide, you can see, you can see the uh, type of materials and activity that were elabora elaborated in a collaborative way between partners. So the process was the same as the curriculum design. There was one partner responsible for the elaboration, in this case, of one of the modules of the course. Then all partners uh, gave feedback, then made improvements on that, new revision, implementation, to finally piloting of, of content and technical aspects of every module and final uh, improvement. So it's an iterative, it was, it has been a, an, an iterative uh, process. And what we have in our, um, in our MOOC is uh, videos, of course. Um, we have like introductory videos that were also collaborative made uh, because uh, the scripts were uh, made collaboratively and recording by one partner with the technical support from another partner everything, of course, from the distance with uh, Zoom and other um, uh, tools. Uh, we have also existing uh, videos. And um, one of the, the aspects that Fabio was also talking about, we, we included um, cases, case studies. So um, we did uh, interviews with national and regional uh, experts showing examples of civic uh, of digital civic engagement uh, and examples of how to use these tools because we, we were as, as we told you focusing on the practical side uh, and also this was made collaborative the the, the scripts questions for for the interviews and also collaborating with with the experts. Uh, apart from the videos, we have explanat explanatory uh, materials, uh, theory, but from a, with a focus on practical perspective, examples of digital participatory tools in all modules. And um, for um, practice or assessment, we have self-evaluation tests, reflection activities in forums, and as I told you, collaborative activities with uh, external tools, uh, tools like the one we are using today, Padlet. So that's the idea how we created the MOOC. And finally, the result uh, is going to be presented very briefly by Cristina. 
Thank you very much, Bea. Quickly before um, passing over to yes. uh, Christina, just a couple of uh, points here as somebody who has participated mm-hmm. in this uh, process. And I think in a, in a way, a little tongue in cheek, we could actually call this a D MOOC. I mean, you've heard about X MOOCs and C MOOCs and L MOOCs and S MOOCs, etc. But I think we could definitely call this a D MOOC, D being democratic, because I don't think I've ever, ever participated in a development process that was so... Uh, so thoroughly considered in 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 this democratic fashion, and I think it's been quite quite interesting. So let me leave you, the public, with a um, the participants, sorry, with a question to reflect on as we as we carry on, and then maybe we can come back to it later on. I mean, do you think that you can tell that we've been through this process, or do you think you should be able to tell? That might be the better question by actually looking at the MOOC. Uh, I'll leave you to to reflect a bit uh, on that, and then uh, thank you. But I'm going to pass on to to Christina now. Thank you, and thank you, Bea, for also for your great work as orchestra director during the um, the course design and, and production. So this is uh, the result of our orchestrated democratic DMOOC. Um, the title is Civics uh, 4.0: Active Citizenship and Participation in the Digital Age. It's a six week MOOC intended for anyone, uh, but especially with a focus on university students and youth from diverse backgrounds, interested in digital civic education and digital participation. Uh, There is no entry requirement. And at the end of the MOOC, participants will be able to understand active digital citizenship, knowing more uh, about what are the skills needed to be an active digital citizen, Uh, being able to monitor policy, being able to connect with people in the community, identify tools on how to engage and organize a campaign in the digital age. They will increase capacity to participate effectively and responsibly in the community And at the end of the MOOC, they will put in practice all the learning acquired through the the course um, with uh, final project work. Um, Based on the current plans, la première of of the MOOC uh, will be soon. So we are planning to launch it uh, towards the end of April. And it will be hosted in the UNED platform and it will run for uh, six weeks. So this was the promotional part of the MOOC, so stay tuned when the MOOC will be out. Um, There will be announcements through our website and and social media. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. I mean, as you say, as you can see from from the structure of this uh, this course, we've tried to make it as as active and interactive as possible and, and relevant to the um, the the social and cultural profile of the typical students who will be um, um, who are our intended audience. It doesn't mean it's uh, excluding anybody else, but uh, that's the way we've gone through that. Okay, so what we want to do now is just pause for a second and um, compare this process with, if you like, a typical institutional um, perspective on how MOOCs are, are done. Now, um, I was actually the founding director of Open UNED, which started in 2012. And I just very briefly want to walk you through the way that we did um, MOOCs at the time, at least uh, several years afterwards, although it's evolved from there, obviously, and uh, and compare it with the way that um, we just talked about this this, um, orchestral uh, way of uh, developing a MOOC course. Now, back in 2012, if you remember, that was the so-called year of the MOOC. There weren't exactly a lot of um, MOOC platforms around to be very generous. Um, in fact, there weren't any. So we uh, we banged out our own open software called Open Open MOOC, which we used for the first couple of iterations of the courses. I mean, Google Course Builder came online afterwards and Open edX much, much later. Now, the interesting perhaps perspective for us is that you know, it's essentially um, um, an online educational university with a blended methodology. So we didn't have the first hurdle you have to cross when building this kind of uh, course, which is 
uh, that people aren't necessarily um, familiar with the sorts of materials that you can actually put online. Um, so, for example, you really wouldn't want to put a 30 page PDF document as part of a course. That really wouldn't be a key to, to success. So we didn't have this kind of problem because our teachers have been preparing online courses since the year 2000 when we had our first online campus. So we're reasonably familiar with that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it was all um, sunshine and light and laughter and happiness, because um, what we also decided is that since um, our main VLE, like most um, universities that have a, a, an LMS or a VLE, a platform that they carry their, their official um, teaching and learning on, it has a very rigid structure, not because of any technological, educational or methodological reasons, but for typically uh, political reasons, because you want to keep things carefully under control with a, a structure that has to be approved that reflect as far as possible the study plans that have gone through official bodies, et cetera, et cetera. So things are always done in a particular way. What does that mean? It, what, it, what it really means is if the only tool you have is a hammer, then you treat everything as nails, boom, 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 boom. The course is all pretty similar. So for example, if a student's doing a course, uh, I don't know, a degree in economics and wants to do a free module for mathematics, then they should find the environment to be exactly the same in the structure of the materials and the support and quality. Now, what we wanted to do when we kicked off the MOOC platform was basically let people uh, play around and do um, different things. So we had a different platform and um, we provided a, some degree of support. I mean, obviously we didn't have the funding to give huge amounts of support, but we basically said to the teachers, hey, play and see what kind of MOOCs you can come up with. And uh, we gave the support that was actually, um, um, was what we could actually give at the time. Now, the interesting thing is that had some advantages, but also some disadvantages, because even though they had different platforms, they seem, still came along with the same expectations for support, quality, and structure. And as uh, Fabio said earlier, quite a large number of our students weren't, in fact, people who had been excluded from uh, the formal educational process who we would have loved to have included in our learning program. A lot of them were actually people who are on our degree courses. I just thought it might be interesting to do some of our courses. And of course, they came along and found a different platform, different support mechanism, different way of um, uh, applying quality me uh, mechanisms to the materials. So there was a bit of a mismatch of of expectations, which actually led to a bit of uh, a little bit of a friction and and, uh, and difficulty at the beginning. So I mean, okay, I'm, I'm going off topic a bit, but I think it's an interesting point to to uh, to make. Now, having said that, we actually gave people carte blanche to be able to develop the MOOCs in the way they wanted to. So to begin with, we had a range of um, courses. We had the the one man band, single um, lecturers who wanted to take some topics, some material they had that perhaps wasn't particularly being used in their official teaching and move it online. And then we had other people that wanted to form small groups of teachers and also um, prepare their courses um, in that way. To be blisteringly honest, I have to admit, to begin with, since this was a platform we developed ourselves, the, the technological um, possibilities with the platform weren't that great to begin with. So a lot of the courses ended up looking pretty similar for that reason. But then as um, the platform got developed and we gradually moved over to Open edX, which is a, a reasonably good platform, then um, it gives a lot more choice and possibilities for, um, for the flexible development of, um, of courses. So, I mean, basically we came across these different um, approaches and groups of people who wanted to undertake the courses. And they'd come along and say, OK, um, I'd like to do this um, MOOC on this particular topic. And we'd say, OK, that sounds good. Have you thought about the kind of structure you've used? Are you bringing materials from other areas? So, I mean, typically uh, a MOOC will last us um, I think I said earlier, like the, the structure we have at the moment is about six weeks. And that's typical for a, um, a MOOC. Where, I mean, six weeks in the sense of having four core weeks of working with a one warm up and a, a one cool down week at the end of the at the end of the course. So you really want to think about how to structure that kind of um, time to make it reasonable for the amount of um, effort that people can actually give to study in that time. Um, during that particular process. So if sometimes somebody would come along and they've got perhaps material from a, a big course that run uh, previously and they wanted to adapt it online, then they would also have to bear that in mind because otherwise it would just be overload for the students. And we had examples of that because at the end of the day, we could encourage, we could persuade, we could cajole, but we didn't really have the, uh, the right or the institutional muscle to be able to say to them, 
thou shalt not do a course in this particular way. So you had a bit of everything to begin with, and that was obviously quite an interesting learning experience for them, for us, and also for the um, the teachers. Another difference, which I think Bay has also mentioned as well, is the role of the people in the particular courses. I mean, in the sense that on official courses, the teachers, the people who prepare the materials in the courses, are also the ones who are most active in the forums, the chat, and the synchronous and asynchronous communication with the, the students. They're encouraging them in the activities, they're supporting them, answering any particular questions and uh, leading particular activities. Now, the big difference with um, a lot of the MOOCs is that the um, teachers, they set up the course and they might be around uh, particularly you know, in, a moment, in some moments of a particular course, but they're not there all the time. That's not their key role in the course. That's when you need to think about facilitators. You've got people who um, are trying to keep uh, motivation going through the particular modules and trying to get, keep the, um, the students actually engaged with what's actually going on. So this was something we had to try and communicate to our, our teaching staff. We had to sort of say to them, okay, well, who's, uh, who's facilitating this course for you? Um, are you going to do it? Are you going to get some of... Um, perhaps some of the you know, tutors to do this for you, call up um, other colleagues you have in other institutions, but it's, it's something that needs to be, uh, to be looked at from the, from the beginning. Because what you can see by studying the studies that have been done on MOOCs is that you've got a lot of um, effort at the very beginning, and then that typically dies away as the, uh, as the course goes, um, as the course goes um, on. So it's something that you need to, uh, to keep into uh, into account. Okay, so I mean, we've had examples of both um, types, and I think our particular experience wouldn't necessarily be the same as um, other institutions because I mean, some typical face to face universities um, have started very, very successful, very high quality uh, MOOC platforms, and um, perhaps that's required a little bit of a adapting on the part of their of their teaching staff and once again they they sometimes combine um materials they have in different ways in a particular course and sometimes you might have one individual teacher and other times you might have um groups of uh teachers other particular recipes for preparing courses that i've come across during this period is people who for example were working on something fabio said before um open educational resources which has been a, a huge field of, of endeavor of endeavor for the democratization of education and uh, social inclusion etc and then you'll find people who might have um, prepared open educational uh, resources and they want to give life to these resources in a way. They want to give the, the flip side of the coin, the open educational practices, and want to turn these OERs into, into MOOCs. And uh, sometimes it can actually be the authors of the materials who want to do that. And sometimes it can actually be uh, people from um, who are interested in these materials, but, not, but um, haven't necessarily been involved in their, in their preparation. And once again, it can be a, a, a one-person attempt, or it can be a more orchestrated, actually, um, approach. And I think, um, finally, something which I think is very important to say, which I think also um, the other presenters have, uh, have said beforehand, is that um, even a one-man band as such is a bit of, perhaps a little bit of a, a misnomer, because Behind that person, you've got the uh, you've got the, the the methodological support staff, which are helping with the, the materials and the activities. You've got the technical um, support staff, and you've got the people actually running the uh, the platforms. So there's there's quite actually a lot of um, of work actually going on to uh, to do this. And um, the only thing I would like to I think defend about this whole um, um, different ways of actually preparing these courses is that to try and encourage the freedom and um, the educational experimentation because sometimes we get, we get locked into the same ways of doing things and teaching things and that is a bit of a shame and that by doing courses like MOOC and different approaches to actually preparing them then we can explore the conceptual space of possibilities with our students and with our colleagues and come up with um, 
with different kinds of courses that are actually quite uh, or quite interesting uh, and beneficial for the people. And I'd encourage you to, to go and have a look at our course um, catalogue. And the interesting thing is that even though it doesn't have this official um, rigid structure of uh, course preparation, then the majority of the courses are actually the, the same. Quite why this is the case, I don't know if it's an educational phenomenon, psychological, or just a social cultural uh, phenomenon that living and working together, we end up doing things in a similar way. But uh, Okay, that's what I particularly wanted to to add there. So, um, what I'm going to do now is to um... Tim. Sorry, Tim. We, we, yeah, no, just to say that we have a few questions, and especially one I think a difficult one for you. We have some yes. easy questions <laughs> that we can take care of, and a difficult one for you. Can we start with a difficult one? By all means, I've stopped sharing screen, so yeah. um, you've been following the questions. So perhaps you can. Uh, can uh, present them to the, the people you think are most relevant to answering them. Yeah, well, I I think it uh, makes sense to answer by voice as well, so that we, I mean, everybody mm -hmm. can hear them. Yeah. So the question by Liam, Liam Murray mm -hmm. is, uh, what is the typical average cost of a MOOC, including design, investment, and ongoing delivery? That's a, a very interesting question, and it's considerably less than what your commercial um, platforms like to charge for them. And it really depends on how you actually come up with the, the bottom line of, of um, the cost of a, a particular course. I've heard people talk about tens of thousands of euros for the, the cost of a MOOC. But what you have to consider is the context in which the course is being developed and, um, and used. And the classic uh, story, which I particularly like about this, was that perhaps I shouldn't talk about the actual institution name for for um, political reasons but um, let's just say one of the big open educational universities in Europe had a problem uh, I don't know 10 years ago or 15 years ago because what they were doing in the realms of open education I mean they weren't calling them MOOCs at the time but it was essentially the open uh, courses were being if you like frowned upon by the managers of the of the um, of the university who are, as usual were concerned about cutting costs they didn't want to uh, have uh, have money spent on this and then the the guy who was the director of the program who's a a, a friend of mine um what he did to, to to close this conversation once and forever was to measure click through to actually say okay um if i put a um, a half page advert for the official training courses at my university in a prestigious broadsheet um, newspaper. I know how many how many thousands of um, euros that's going to cost. Now, if I do this particular online course and set up a, a similar kind of click through me mechanism, then you can actually measure and show that you get more click through from the people actually doing the courses than from the ones reading the newspaper. So um, the actual the cost benefit is, is there in a particular way. Because I mean, Liam, if, I don't know exactly where you're coming from to ask me that question. But for example, if you wanted to um, have your own MOOC on a platform, you don't actually have the platform, then there's a whole set of skills and, and resources you'd need to actually be able to, to do that. You need to be thinking about the inst instructional design, for example, are you going to call in somebody to actually help you with that? Have you got somebody in your in your team or your educational context to actually help you with that? Then when you're thinking about putting the, the course online, do you want it branded with your particular institution or would you be happy to put it on, um, on one of the many open um, platforms that are actually around? So is there a form model, for example, where they... It depends. I mean, typically we um, don't pay the people who are moderating the forms. If they're in the forms, it's because... Um, they're doing it for a range of um, of a range of issues. Yes, they'd be, they'd be there for the the entire six weeks, but that doesn't need to mean that they necessarily need to be working the entire time. I mean, if you've got a group, you have to see. Okay, how many people have, have I got who want to? Um, be the facilitators for a particular course. Let's think about how they're going to engage with the students. Are they particularly interested in one in, in one module or one particular subject? And we can divide them up and then give them the support for the for the. Um, teachers because from my experience they are usually for example in our case uh, tutors from the UNED or people who are actually working with um, students and they are heavily motivated in help working with uh, with uh, their students for example in the last summer Erasmus plus project we did moonlight we did a language MOOCs for social inclusion and it was the we contacted the the um, non-governmental organizations that were in and around Madrid I think we got in contact with 20 of them in the end and got them to um, 
to help us actually do this course. And um, then we found the people who are actually working with the, the refugees and migrants were volunteering to be the forum moderators and were particularly happy to, uh, to do that. I mean, if you actually do this in, a, in sheer pure economic um, terms, then it can be quite expensive if you're, if you're, if you're doing it. But really, if you, if you contextualize it in a, in a broader, more socially integrated um, environment, then people are, are usually quite happy to participate and actually support the course. If anybody wants to add anything to that, uh, to that answer. Just adding, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the recently finished EMMA project. It was a European project. I think it was a, coming from the research side of the commission. And the, the objective there was to co-develop MOOCs. I mean, not, not just to, to build a platform like the classical platform, MOOC platforms where you have MOOCs from different universities and the platform is just displaying them. But that was really... The idea was to provide a platform for automatic translation and also some cultural collaboration around different kinds of MOOCs. And there, the main issue, apart from the classical sustainability of these kinds of projects, was the cost involved. Because uh, as you say, if you want to do a MOOC by engaging more than one professor, in our case, we, we are supported by European projects, but the work simply multiplies. I mean, you can go from a very limited cost. You can use uh, one of those platforms out there and just put your stuff there. But if you want to integrate different views and different things, it can it can become expensive, especially in terms of times. Yeah, I I quite agree. And also, I I think I. I should feel quite fortunate in the sense that our institution actually provides us with a, a platform for us to use and a support mechanism and technical staff at um, well, zero cost. But I mean, obviously, there's no such thing as uh, as free. So that cost is being absorbed as part of uh, the overall budget for um, online teaching and dissemination and, and, and different kinds of activities. I'm just beginning to on some of the, the the comments in the chat because this is before I could actually see them. And it was interesting what I saw about... Um, Mariana Lizonja, about um, a specific MOOC for female entrepreneurs with such a high uh, success rate. I think um, experience also shows that with courses that are specifically focused and prepared for a, a direct collective, then you can have a better um, uh, success rate. But it also depends not just on the things we've spoken before, but doing it in such a way that it's actually uh, it meets the expectations of the students who are um, doing this course. Now, one particular example I can think of in for this point, which is not really to do with MOOCs, although it's for an online course, and I think it's directly relevant, is that a colleague was trying to uh, prepare some online training for, for, for women in, in Palestine. And the what they had in common, these, these ladies, was that they, they, they'd, they'd suffered an awful lot of uh, um, you know, bad treatment by typically by males, etc., in in that particular region for the reasons you can probably imagine, and um, they were feeling very alienated. And it was really quite interesting because the typical dynamic is you could have a study session, and you might have a group of maybe uh, fifteen ladies connected with their webcams on, although they'd be wearing their their um, the traditional clothes, but they still be active and participating. But the second that one male connected to that particular environment, who'd be a member of the teaching team, they'd all switch the cameras off immediately and the, the participation would actually uh, um, go down enormously. So sometimes when you're thinking about preparing a particular kind of uh, course, it's important to, to make sure that the people who are appearing on the um, courses are from the same social uh, social group and sometimes you can talk about educational proxies there to uh to actually enable that connection to uh, to take place but i mean if we take your question out of context liam for example let's imagine for the sake of argument you're not in an institution that would actually support you i think these days there are plenty of um of online tools i don't want to particularly want to mention one tech provider over another but if you actually search around there's there's plenty of way plenty of ways of, of doing MOOCs without a MOOC platform or doing a course without any platform at all and that's actually provides us with a very rich and varied way of, of integrating uh, our activity with people's uh, desires to, to learn okay uh fabio were there other questions maybe maybe for other members of the panel <coughs> Yeah, I think there is a question on uh, on assessment within our MOOC and uh, also which goes from peer assessment to anything we use. And in this, I, I think, Bea, you can answer maybe this question. And then there is another strategic question for you, Tim, on uh, 
if, if there is a model that can be used to cost and justify the creation of a MOOC to a higher education institution, to a university. So how to advocate for a new MOOC with a, with a proof that it will not cost so much. So that's... Uh, Okay, but maybe, Bea, you can uh, briefly explain how the assessment will work in the MOOC? Yes. Uh, apart from the self-evaluation and the with a test and also checking that they are, no, the videos and, and readings are, are being uh, visualized, we, as we said at the beginning, we have collaborative activities and a final activity that is the final project um where they the participants will have to put all they have learned in practice following a very simple template that we designed and they will receive feedback from the team uh, it's true that this um particular um, collaborative activity uh, i get they can do individually or collaborative uh, between them but these um activities are uh, presented like um, optional or voluntary because uh, you know you you can't uh, force a, a, everyone to to do all the all the activities in the MOOC. But yes, we we were trying not to offer only the typical no self evaluation test, but other kind of activities where they can also reflect and and those who are more motivating or have more time can can do it and we will uh, provide feedback to those yeah, and, and anything else fabio no you? just a comment on this which is also connected to the cost i think liam was also commenting on the cost of moderators and facilitators during the mooc of course we we took that into account and uh, also there the idea is to use the the project partners and people from the project partners to help so that we can have a multi national and multilingual group but of course that's an important cost uh, especially when you have big number we have no clue about how, how many people will uh, will participate in the first edition of the MOOC so there uh, we, we actually and in that case you still don't know the co you, you don't know the cost until you launch a MOOC because if you want to do it uh, with some interactivity you need to, to to include the cost or the time of some uh, some facilitators and people and so in that case it's a it's a moving target they would say the, the final cost of a single course. Yeah, I, I agree. Assessment has always been a big, a big issue in um, in MOOCs because typically it's very hard for if you've got a, a ratio of maybe one or two teachers to, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 students, which you can have or more, then um, obviously it's very difficult to do any meaningful assessment because um, if you put a, some kind of closed, closed uh, test on a course, then you can show that the students have been following the material and they've understood what's actually being shown to them. But it's not really demonstrating that they can apply the uh, um, apply the knowledge they're actually learning. The good news is that I think we've moved on from these sorts of problems. And um, I've got uh, colleagues um, like um, um, Maria Dolores Castillo, if you search for her online, who um, has done a lot of work in this area and um, shown that you can actually uh, develop, if you like, um, rubrics, sets of instructions to enable students to correct each other's work. And that way you can actually set up um, peer um, evaluation in a particular course, which obviously it's not the same as having expert evaluation, but it's um, it's pretty good and can actually enable us to um, to actually uh, provide some degree of assessment to actually uh, going on. Should we, should we play the game with Padlet? Because yeah, why not? I think it's good to play. Yeah, okay. So as I said, I'm not going to share the screen, but we'll talk while it's um, going. Oh, do, do we have any? Oh, we have some likes. We can start thinking about that uh, now, perhaps. I'm sure anyone's been able to uh, connect to it. Okay, so the way this is uh, structured, if you're across on the page, is that we have the, um, maybe I should just share the screen briefly. Hang on a second, let me go back here. And then, I'll do it, then. don't worry, I'll do it. Okay, so thanks, Dan, and then I can, uh, makes life easier. Thank you. That way you can see, even if you're not on the, on the, on the page. Okay, so what we've done here is, um, what Bea has done, is actually um, set the, different types of um, MOOCs up with the pros and cons, the things that you might appear might think are easier with one kind of uh, 
um, MOOC than the the other. So, for example, I mean, it occurs to me that, uh, for example, a one man MOOC, what's what's easy is this the the coordination because basically you can decide um, just with yourself what you're actually going to. Uh, um, do on a particular course, whereas with the orchestrated version, you have to actually, um, you have to actually have to, uh, you know, sell your ideas to your colleagues and uh, discuss with them and uh, and um, and uh, you know go through the the points you want to do in a more in a more uh, democratic fashion. So that's I feel like one of advantage as of the of the one man move. Okay, so I can see. Uh, Fabio is adding to the the page need, is needed here. Um, okay, the the cons, if you like, in a way, is things that you uh, you know, it's a time that you're uh, having to spend on your own to to do the to do the uh, uh, the course. Maybe I should actually add something here as well to this page. So, um, and uh, we, I mean, we we don't want experts' opinion, so feel free to put. There, what you think? I mean, things. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not necessarily true that you need more time to develop a, a collaborative yes. move, but just we just would like to get your views. So, just if you just double click, the the post it will appear, and you can just put it wherever you want, just to to see if this distinction we made makes sense, or it's maybe too artificial, or if uh, we have some uh, some different opinions. And also, if um, if you've any particular experience of, of doing either one of these uh, MOOCs, then you can give us some feedback on this as well. That would be interesting to uh, to know. Because sometimes you can find um, MOOCs at, at one particular stage start off, if you like, by being a, um, a one-man affair. And then as they start to get developed, then they attract the attention of people who may be initially thinking of participating as facilitators. And then as the uh, development process goes on, they get more and more involved and end up being a member of the teaching team. Or perhaps that can happen over subsequent editions of, uh, of uh, MOOCs. Or maybe you think, in fact, that um, the separation between one man and orchestrated is not quite so dichotic. It's not black and white. There might actually be a whole uh, spectrum of uh, possibilities. Thank you, Leo. If uh, I'd invite you for a coffee, if that were possible, to, to say thanks. It's the first person who's added something to the... Uh... Yep, I think you're completely right. You can, you can write comments as well. I see people mm -hmm. writing comments, so it's uh, perfectly fine. To... Yeah. Yeah, the comments are coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Vlad. See when you've written on there and the end. Actually, the, the, the secret narrative of this webinar is to see if uh, this approach to MOOCs can uh, reply to some of the critics uh, to, you know, some of some of them at least can be smoothened by possibly a collaborative approach of course that would be at least let's say less one way yeah? less top down well, let's say north south for example so it's uh, there is a secret meaning there i think that's uh, very um, very true so it's a, it's a question of um, of mutual support and mutual control because um, when you're you're doing things on your your own, you're applying at the end of the day your own criteria, and um, that can be good. But it's also very good to have other people as a sounding board and to provide. I'm not going to say more rigor, but additional rigor, if you like, ways of actually uh, thinking. You know, have you really thought about this? And what about if uh, if you take into account uh, something else, or maybe they have particular experience, and um, they can share that with you as part of the. Uh, 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 development. I mean, obviously, I suppose implicit in what we're talking about is that the sorts of courses we're talking about are typically more X MOOC oriented than C MOOC because C MOOC by themselves are typically have a, an emergent structure. So um, I think uh, would would maybe tend to be more. Well, I think perhaps you could argue that both aspects because on the one hand they're one man in because somebody has to start them off, but then when they actually take life, they actually get cracking, then they become more orchestrated because then the, if you like, the students or participants on the course are deciding what, they're, uh, what they actually want to learn. And um, so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. 
<clears throat> yeah, and another another comment which was made has to do with the sustainability of MOOCs. So we know that MOOCs or online courses tend to get old pretty soon, depending, of course, also on the subject. But in, I mean, in the case of a, of a decentralized MOOC with different heads on it, and maybe even with different languages, I guess that if you take part on it, then you are you will be thinking of translating it also for your for your your language. So in that case, one MOOC can become more different MOOCs that can take different shapes also in the different uh, in the in the different universities that are using it. So it's. Uh, I think that that was a good point. I don't know if it was Vlad to make it, but I think it's a uh, it's very good. Absolutely, I think that's a, a good point. There's a question raised here by anonymous about uh, about student retention, and I'm not necessarily sure that the retention figures are are different between the two the two kinds of uh, of courses. And um, I am sure you can find examples of uh, one-man courses, which are very good, as the one that Fabio provided earlier. And on the other hand, you can find examples of orchestrated MOOCs that aren't terribly good. So I think um, there's no necessary, necessary guarantee of a particular approach for, for providing a, a specific kind of uh, course. And student retention, I think, um, that can be the can be a problem, and it's helped really by the quality of your facilitators, and also in the um, interest that the group actually have for the course they're actually uh, uh, running. The um, when we've done specifically very vertical, very well focused MOOCs for a particular group of uh, students who we know will be extremely interested in them, then we do find that the retention lasts um, a lot longer. But this is something which can be taken for granted. I don't think you can ever sit back and just think, okay, this course is well designed, it's well structured, the material's good. I'll just sit back and let people um, carry on. Because, I mean, I think most of us have done a MOOC at um, one stage or another. And and um, what do we find? Well, we find that reality comes along, real life, and um, our best intentions of, of the time we were going to be able to spend on a particular course um, drifts away as, as the initial enthusiasm for the course actually uh, goes across. One other thing we haven't actually mentioned, which I think is actually quite important to, to cover, is that quite often on official courses, you have a like a, a sequential structure on the course. It's almost, if you like, a... Um, like a carpet rolling out as the course goes along or a book where the chapters appear as you move along. But typically on most MOOCs, you find the entire course structure open from the very beginning. And um, that can pro provide difficulties for the, um, the students who are actually undertaking their course. And also it can be complicated in the sense that you come along, you go into the, the course, you jump around between the modules, you find the things that you find are quite interesting. And then you step back, and then may not you may miss the actual flow of the uh, of the course. Okay, we got some great comments coming uh, here on the uh, on the Padlet. I'm pleased to see that everyone's uh, well, a lot of people are actually participating with this one man concept work overload. I think that's a very good uh, a very good comment. Yeah. Uh, well, one one thing I forgot to mention. I don't know, Bea, if you also agree is the, the learning dynamics within the team developing the MOOCs. I mean, we shouldn't forget that uh, there should be some professional development also for the educators or for the ones who are working mm -hmm. on the MOOC. And in this specific case, uh, I, I wasn't, I'm not super proficient in the in the field. So I had to work a lot and they were experts, of course, in the, in the team. So actually I had the feeling that it was a, a genuine learning process for many of the people also thinking a bit outside our classical themes, which is good. Mm -hmm. It's refreshing. So I think it uh, lets you discover also interesting new perspectives on things. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Bear, have you got a comment on that? Yes, yes, yes. I was going to say, I was reading the comments at the same time, sorry. Yeah, uh, I totally agree because normally we... Um, it's true that we had in the, it was very interesting that we had uh, in the team, we had experts in the topic and we had experts on developing MOOC. So we have, we had to do um, a very close um, collaborative uh, work and, and kind of uh, understanding to, to put all, all together. I don't know if. 
Yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah. So we comment some of the. Yeah, please do. Uh, let's see, because that. Oh, ah, I like the one of. Uh, I agree. Actually, uh, I, I like collaborative MOOCs, but I, I agree with the one of uh, some, somebody anonymous put in the one mon, man MOOC MOOCs, the coherence. Yeah. Because actually, it's not that a collaborative work is not coherent or consistent, but you have to put a lot of effort to make it coherent more than if you are doing alone. But it but as, as you said um, also um, at the beginning, Fabio, I mean, uh, to put uh, other perspectives and, and ways to, to see the things and ways to present materials and pedagogical approach is also uh, important. So that should be taken into account that maybe one man MOOC has more only one approach, so it's, it's richer. But the coherence is, yes, it's a good point. What else do you want to comment? Anything, Fabio, Cristina? Yeah, maybe I mean, just to comment on what Leo was saying, that uh, what we call now DMOOCs or uh, mm -hmm. MOOCs are close to the C MOOCs, so the original uh, connectivist or more collaborative MOOCs, mainly because there is more space for uh, co-development and reflection also with the learners with the learners so in our in our specific MOOC we for example in every module has at least a couple of reflection moments apart from the self-assessment where students should just uh, you know do something look at for example at a tool for a civic participation and then reflect on this tool in a padlet or in the forum in different places and, and, and co-develop something, mini posts, uh, and even at the end, uh, if they want uh, an optional mini project. So I would say that the more the MOOC is, is, was open, or the, the online course, as Alfredo is saying, it's the same thing, the more it has been designed uh, with an open mind, and in this case, a group is forcing you to have an open mind, otherwise you, don't, uh, you cannot proceed, the more then you can take this open approach into account, so co-creation and this sort of thing. So I think it's a, it's a good parallel with, between uh, orchestrated and CMOOCs. I think it's, it's in that direction, at least. Absolutely, I, I quite agree. Um, it's an interesting uh, comment by Anonymous. The, about the, one of the cons for a one-man MOOCs is the difficulty to answer students' questions. I think it also comes back to the point I was making earlier about the role of facilitators in the course, because it's not typically the teachers who actually answer the questions is the facilitators so for example i can remember one man MOOCs, for example who were smart enough to have a group of um, half a dozen facilitators who actually stepped up to the plate quite nicely and provided that level of um, of answering the other thing which i think is an important factor when doing a course is the homogeneity of um, the student population, because we, I mean, for example, if you're if you're doing an official course on something at a university, for example, it's a first year degree course, then the chances are the majority of the people who are doing that course are in a certain range, age range and have a certain amount of knowledge, which is typically less than the people who are running the course about that subject. Now, since MOOCs are actually open, you quite often find that some of the people who participate in the MOOC are, in fact, people who know an awful lot about it and they're participating because they like it and they find it very interesting and they want to support the initiative. In which case, what you actually find is that um, you actually get students answering each other's questions. And uh, this is um, this is actually wonderfully positive when it uh, happens. Although you have to be careful, obviously, you have to you have to be careful and uh, keep an eye on the sorts of answers that are being uh uh, provided so um, you can get some very nice dynamics set up in these uh, these courses well this is looking really good this pad like it's really really come alive we got a lot of really uh, uh, good comments coming on here uh, Christina you've uh, you've been quiet for a while would you like to pick any of these uh, these comments on the Padlet and uh, give us your opinion on it yeah well I just wanted to add about the um, uh, positive aspects of the collaboration that also the working methods has been an interesting aspect of the uh, collaborative production of the MOOC, um, in addition to all the intercultural things that have been mentioned already, also learning from uh, the other people involved in the production in terms of working methods and which tool 
they use for producing contents, for planning activities. I think this has been also a positive aspect of the orchestrated MOOC. Yep, absolutely. I think that's a, a very good comment to uh, um, to make. Okay, I think this has been been and has has proven to uh, to be an interesting activity. I think uh, people are providing a lot of uh, uh, comments on these uh, these courses. So, um, okay, let's in the, in the perhaps in the, the few minutes that we have uh, um, left, let's go round the table and. Uh, let me ask you the question that if you now had to do a new MOOC at your own institution, not necessarily related to a, a specific project or anything to do with the topics that we've been talking about in Nexus, um, which of the two approaches would you um, would you undertake and and why? Okay, so I'm gonna gonna go around and ask each of you. Um, uh, uh, Fabio, can you can you start please with this? <laughs> Well, I can start. I would say, <laughs> egoistically, I would go for the collaborative one because, again, I have to say I learned a lot and I enjoyed it. So in many cases, when it happened to me to have to, to write content for a course or to design a course actually on, on my themes, on the themes of my research, you feel that, uh, I mean, your own motivation sometimes is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, stagnant because it's uh, you have the more of the same uh, syndrome. Whilst if you... If you explore something in a group, of course, uh, new ideas and uh, normally comes up, come up, and it's uh, so in terms of uh, enjoy enjoyment and and self learning. I have to say, I would definitely go for the collaborative one. But then you have also an efficiency issue, and in terms of efficiency, now we had the luxury of being in a European collaboration project where collaboration is part of the game, and we we had time, of course, to do this, uh, and uh, that is how it should be. Now I'm thinking of a of a professor that has to put online a course, for example, uh, six months ago, or even more when the pandemic started. So that does not have the luxury of taking a few months to do this. So in terms of efficiency, probably some sort of a mixed way, maybe with a, with a, not a one man, but a, I would say a quartet, uh, thinking in musical terms, a quartet, uh, at the very beginning, and, that, that, and then an orchestra joining in a second moment would be maybe maybe better. So you have deficiency in the first part. But actually, if, if I think of our process, I think most of the time was really in the initial part of the design. It was really brainstormings. What do we mean by this? And then when we had the, clear the number of issues, the whole process was very much streamlined, actually. And uh, as Christina was saying, I think it was like working in presence eh, in the same office. So that was that was very, very good. But I think for to to make more efficient the first part, maybe we will start with a trio or a quartet and then move to a full-fledged uh, uh, opera orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, uh, if I had to do it again, uh, maybe now I, I will say, no, please, uh, let's do one mem MOOC or one institution MOOC <laughs> but then uh, I will realize that the because this is the second experience with collaborative MOOCs as you know Tim before with Moonlight and the best results are, are always when you collaborate with you know people that are expertise or with the uh, uh, or are involved with stakeholders like the case the studies experts or um, our um, partners from KIC or ICAS that are real experts on the topic. So I think I will do the same way. I will do it collaboratively. <laughs> okay, thank you. Christina? <laughs> well, yes, I would do collaboratively uh, because we have had some, a lot of fun. But also, um, and, and referring back to the question in the chat before about how we could advocate in higher education institutions for those institutions to prioritize the production of MOOCs, those collaborative MOOCs could be seen also as a way to put in practice many of the memorandum of understanding for international cooperation that we have. So those type of collaborative activities can be a way to um, collaborate with other institutions to internationalize the curriculum, but in a real case scenario, so really working together 
and at the end, um, also within the institution, with people from different faculty, I think in, in, at the end, it's a way to set up efficient working groups and teams. And that may be also an added value for the institutions and for the higher education collaborations. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I agree with all of you. Um, I think really the added value comes from the diversity of the people participating in the orchestra, if you like. I mean, if we were all violinists or we all played the, um, the drum, for example, then I don't think the collaboration would work quite so well. I mean, it's the fact we're all bringing something different to the table. I also think that um, it's that each part of the approach doesn't necessarily exclude the other because there are some times when you want to be working individually or perhaps in a small um, key core team and other times when you want to widen up for, for participation because I mean in our particular case now we're really um, the clock is running down we're coming towards the end of this development um, period and um, it's just very very creative and wonderful like we had a, a project meeting today for example and we start talking about it and lots of things come up and uh, the thing is we have to move towards uh, closure on this particular issue so therefore I think it's good to have a small um, uh, set of uh, people. Maybe in our case, it's going to be just just us us four, and we're going to be the pragmatists, and we're going to be taking the decisions, the executive decisions that have to be taken. But the nice thing about the whole MOOC life cycle is, since it's iterative, you have the first, second um, versions of the course, then. Um, it's not the end of the world if you decide not to do something for uh, a first edition, or if, even if you decide to do something for a first particular um, edition of a, of a course, because um, it's always something you can try again in, in future versions of the course. So uh, in, in general, I'd encourage everyone to, to get collaborating in, in, um, in MOOCs and other on online um, open educational initiatives. I mean, MOOCs are not by any stretch of the imagine the only way to to uh, attack this particular project. And at the end of the day, I think the added value comes from the collaboration. So um, we've got a couple of minutes um, left to us now. I mean, I'm sorry we're not really paying a lot of attention to all the comments that are coming. Seems some some old colleagues and friends coming in the uh, in the chat. It's really lovely to see you here, and I'm pleased you've actually in the. Um, in, enjoyed that one thing. The last thing I'm going to do, although it has come up in the um, in the, the chat is flip back to the presentation to please encourage you to come to tomorrow's event in the Eden 2020, 2021 OEW uh, series, the webinar on supporting teaching and learning in schools through um, open educational resources, lessons from the, the pandemic. It was moderated by my colleague and friend, Antonio Teixeira. And I think that looks, that promises to be a very uh, interesting uh, event. So if you, you can find the link to this now to register, here, you got a, a shortened address and also on the um, Eden Online uh, website. So I'll just leave this here for a little while for you to see. Uh, thank you all very much for having come along and for having participated so well. I mean, when we, uh, whenever you set up a Padlet, you can never really tell how it's going to uh, work out. And I think we're, we're very grateful. So um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's uh, participated in this. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you to the wonderful technical support we've had from, from Eden, from Diana, and for everyone who's actually uh, come along today. I look forward to uh, meeting you face to face in the, in the future. Thank you very much and bye.